Riding on the shoulders of the Apollo generation, the Artemis missions, or even SpaceX, will pave the way for humans to return to the moon, beginning the human exploration of Mars, and someday for humanity to reach the edges of our solar system and beyond. While the exploration of deep space is critical to advancing our understanding of so many unanswered questions about the universe and our place in it, it's equally as critical that the U.S. government and private industry work together to lead the commercialization of Low Earth Orbit (LEO) and capture the resulting massive new space economy. Sadly, the most popular broomstick in the United States, SpaceX Dragon, will not be produced anymore. That's when people are looking for another spacecraft, the highlight of which is the Dream Chaser. In fact, the Dream Chaser team is making huge progress for the first launch. In April, the first Dream Chaser vehicle took shape. The first Dream Chaser, named Tenacity, was assembled at the Colorado headquarters, and at that point the vehicle structure was largely complete, but there's still more work to install the thermal protection system and other components. We have the wings on now, it really looks like a space plane, said Janet Cavandi, president of Sierra Space, during a panel at the AIAA Ascendex Texas Conference in Houston, April 28th, where she played a video showing work building the vehicle. And last month in a tweet, Sierra Space revealed that right now our Dream Chaser team is hard at work of fixing more than 2,000 hand-cut thermal tiles. We'll have more photos and close-ups of Tenacity coming soon. The engineers are using similar technology that was used to protect the space shuttle when it flew. A TPS is designed to protect the spacecraft from aerothermal heating when re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, temperatures that can reach 1650 centigrade or 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. In the case of Dream Chaser, the TPS ensures a safe entry, descent, and runway landing. The TPS includes a coating made of various heat-resistant material. In the cases of both the Space Shuttle Orbiter and Dream Chaser, this coating is made of tiles. Dream Chaser is about a quarter the size of the Space Shuttle Orbiter and only needs 2,000 TPS tiles compared to the 24,000 used on the Space Shuttle. Fewer tiles are needed because the craft is smaller, but the tiles are also bigger. Dream Chaser tiles are approximately 10 by 10 inches, while the tiles that were on the shuttle were about 6 by 6. SNC TPS engineers utilize a room temperature vulcanizing RTV silicone, which can withstand high temperature to keep those tiles bonded to the vehicle at all times. The bonded tiles are tested by a pulling mechanism to avoid the issues of the tiles falling off. In another process, NASA tweeted mentioning teamwork makes the Dream Chaser work. The first joint training simulation for NASA and Sierra spaceflight controllers happened earlier this month. The teams practiced operations for the new Dream Chaser spacecraft to fly to the space station. Sierra Space replied, highlighting, Our team enjoyed working with NASA flight operations teams preparing for the upcoming Dream Chaser CRS-2 cargo mission. For the next step, Sierra Space will ship it to the Kennedy Space Center for integration onto the Vulcan rocket with a launch tentatively planned for early 2023. As of right now, Vulcan is scheduled to have its first launch in the coming months. Assuming everything goes perfectly, its second ever mission will be with Dream Chaser Tenacity as a payload. This is the first of six cargo deliveries planned under a NASA cargo contract awarded after the commercial crew disappointment in 2014. In parallel, Sierra is refining the design for a crew variant now scheduled to debut in the mid-2020s. I got to thinking about it and said, you know, it's almost better to do cargo first, recalled Lindsay, the Sierra senior vice president who oversees Dream Chaser development. Because of the commonality between the cargo and crewed version, we'll have a flight-proven vehicle before the crewed variant carries humans. From a risk standpoint, that makes me feel a lot better, actually. Sierra plans to build a fleet between 10 and 15 Dream Chasers by 2030, although the breakdown between cargo and crew variants is still to be determined. Along with the six cargo flights for NASA, plans call for cargo and crew Dream Chasers to ferry supplies and passengers to the Orbital Reef Space Station that Sierra and Blue Origin plan to erect in low Earth orbit by 2027. 
Sierra Space has also discussed making a version of Dream Chaser for national security missions, but offered few specifics about how it would be different from the cargo or crew version. There's been speculation it would have capabilities similar to the U.S. Space Force X-37B space plane, whose missions have been largely shrouded in secrecy. All these missions are perfectly possible because Dream Chaser has a lot of potential. In theory, the Dream Chaser space plane is a multi-mission vehicle capable of supporting a variety of LEO needs. Most importantly, designed for high reusability, the vehicle reduces overall cost, providing quick turnaround between missions. The ability to lift off on top of multiple launch vehicles and land in a wide variety of runways makes Dream Chaser a flexible option for reliable transportation. After leaving the space station, the Dream Chaser cargo system also offers disposal services via the Shooting Star transport vehicle. Once separated from Dream Chaser, Shooting Star burns up safely in Earth's atmosphere. With the help of the Shooting Star service module, Dream Chaser can deliver up to 5,500 kilograms of pressurized and unpressurized cargo to the space station, and that includes food, water, supplies, and science experiments, and returns to Earth. Dream Chaser can return critical cargo at less than 1.5 grams using a gentle runway landing. NASA currently receives ISS cargo shipments from SpaceX and Northrop Grumman. SpaceX's Dragon capsule is designed to send cargo back to Earth while Northrop Grumman's Cygnus burns up naturally in the atmosphere. The shuttle-shaped Dream Chaser will be another alternative to these capsules. In addition, Dream Chaser is 30 feet or 9 meters long roughly one-fourth the total length of the Space Shuttle Orbiter, and it can carry up to seven crew members. The crewed version of Dream Chaser is approximately 85% common to the cargo system, limiting primary changes to windows, environmental control, and life support systems. In addition, an integral main propulsion system is available for abort capability and major orbital maneuvers. It can also be customized for both domestic and international customers via vehicle configuration, launch site, destination, landing site, duration, and a host of other vehicles. The company has entered into agreements with multiple international space agencies. Together, they're developing technologies, applications, and missions for Dream Chaser-based space systems. However, after all, it first needs to launch and demonstrate that it's capable of what it says. Wishing all the best for them. The last American space plane to complete a mission in orbit touched down at the Kennedy Space Center on July 21, 2011, when the Space Shuttle Orbiter Atlantis came to a wheel stop at the end of the 4,572-meter-long runway. It marked the end of an era for NASA. But thanks to Sierra Nevada and its now legally separate Sierra Space offshoot, the era of the reusable space plane is not at an end. Based on a NASA concept from the 1990s designed to complement the shuttle, Sierra Space's Dream Chaser has been refined into a state-of-the-art space plane with a carbon fiber body and advanced avionics capable of doing things other spacecraft cannot. So how will the Dream Chaser space plane succeed where the space shuttle failed? In Las Vegas at the Consumer Electronics Show 2022, Sierra Space announced they are scaling their Dream Chaser to carry astronauts into low Earth orbit. While the Dream Chaser does look a lot like the Space Shuttle, its differences are why it could succeed where the shuttle failed. Both the Space Shuttle and Dream Chaser have been built to build space stations, but the Dream Chaser is smaller, lighter, and uses a different launch system and its re-entry is different. Let's look back at a little history on aeronautics. The first space plane was NASA's X-15. It was small, agile, launched in midair by a B-52, and its body was covered in Iconel X, a super alloy. And Conel X withstood the 1300 degree Fahrenheit that happened during hypersonic flight and re-entry. The original design of the space shuttle in 1970 was a very scaled up version of the X-15. They knew it would work because the X-15 was successful, but it had a problem. It was costly to build, especially since the space race was over. Budget cuts and lack of political will ended up changing the shuttle. First, the launch system was altered for a rocket, then more budget cuts led to a solid rocket booster launch system. Engineers warned that solid rocket boosters couldn't be turned off once they started. 
This was what caused the Challenger tragedy years later. The shuttle also got bigger and bigger. This forced engineers to extend the wings and the extended contact surface that heated up on re-entry. A tile protection system was designed to protect the shuttle, but the system was flawed. It caused a lot of problems and finally triggered the Columbia re-entry tragedy, killing another seven astronauts and canceling the era of space planes. However, the Dream Chaser is different. Firstly, it seems very small when compared to the shuttle, but honestly, its size is its strength, and it's actually its most important attribute. Whereas the single space shuttle launch was a $1.6 billion investment, a smaller space plane roughly a quarter the shuttle's size is thought to cost at least a quarter what the larger space plane would. Indeed, the space shuttle could carry as much as 65,000 pounds or 29,000 kilos of cargo into low Earth orbit. But in a time where Delta IVs, Arian 5s, and Falcon Heavies do a lovely job of launching probes and satellites, there simply isn't much need for the proverbial space pickup truck, as the space shuttle ultimately became. The Dream Chaser's more modest payload of 11,000 pounds or 5,000 kilograms or 5 tons might not nearly be as impressive, but unlike the space shuttle, Sierra Space's prized space plane is designed to fly as a fleet of more than a measly six. Besides, it's agile. It can take on safe re-entry configuration. Its wing surface is nowhere near as big as the shuttle because it's not that heavy or not that big. It doesn't launch on rocket boosters. It launches on top of a standard rocket mounted like a capsule. And these are significant differences in aeronautics. Sierra Space says the Dream Chaser is a third generation space plane built on four decades of the shuttle legacy. The shuttle failed to make space travel safe and affordable, but it also flew 135 missions and 400 people to space, built the ISS, and repaired the Hubble. Like the shuttle, Dream Chaser will also make a new space station and carry astronauts to space on a space plane once again. Another important comparison that relates to the size of the spacecraft has to do with heat shields and the number of tiles. TPS tiles protect the vehicle from re-entry heat. Around 2,000 of these tiles will protect Dream Chaser from temps that could reach upwards of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit on entry while keeping the vehicle itself at only 350 degrees Fahrenheit. The white tiles reject more heat from the sun while on orbit, which helps keep the components within Dream Chaser's cooler. In comparison, about 24,000 tiles were used on NASA's Space Shuttle's orbiters. Dream Chaser's about 30 feet long, or about one-fourth the total length of the Space Shuttle. Especially in order to keep the tiles on Dream Chaser, the engineers are using room temperature vulcanizing, or RTV silicone. RTV silicone is able to withstand high temperatures, making it perfect for bonding the tile, and each tile is tested using a mechanism that pulls them off, which ensures the bond is sufficient. That helps avoid issues of tiles falling off, which happened early in the space shuttle program. And you may know when workers first tried to ferry Shuttle Columbia to the Kennedy Space Center in 1979 on the back of a 747, hundreds of TPS tiles tore from the ship during the initial stage of flight simply from air resistance and flow. Now, had that occurred on launch and not the ferry flight, Columbia and her two-person crew would likely have been doomed. As it was when Columbia launched STS-1 on April 12th of 1981, a few TPS tiles still came free during launch, but thankfully the missing tiles were from areas of the vehicle that could survive atmospheric re-entry without them. Clearly, SNC engineers have been able to update TPS tiles from what was used during NASA's shuttle program with more innovation, better technology, and utilizing lessons learned. They use more modern manufacturing techniques to increase strength and reduce cost. Another difference between the tiles is Dream Chaser tiles are about 10 inches by 10 inches. Those on the shuttle were 6 by 6. Dream Chaser also smaller in size, which means fewer tiles to replace in general. Dream Chaser tiles are also stronger and lighter weight than those used during the shuttle program, and they meet all the micrometeoroid orbital debris requirements. That's the MMOD, which ensures safe entry, descent, and runway landing for a crewed or cargo mission. Already, a founding group of three Dream Chaser orbiters is nearing completion, with several more undoubtedly on the way, and it should the first cargo and manned missions go smoothly. The maiden unmanned launch is currently scheduled around February of 2023 aboard a ULA Vulcan Centaur booster rocket. 
a novel two-stage heavy lift launch vehicle developed to be one of the most cost-effective booster rockets in its classification. In due time, we'll see if the Dream Chaser approach to reusable space planes lives up to the expectation of the shuttle's chief architect, Dr. Maxime Faget, better than even his own brainchild. In 2014, NASA has chosen Boeing and SpaceX to build the vehicles that will transport its astronauts to the International Space Station. The loser is Sierra Nevada with Dream Chaser. Eight years later from that time, SpaceX Dragon has now flown five crews to ISS, but the number of Boeing Starliners, uh, zero. More seriously, due to lack of confidence, NASA's even delayed the first flight of Boeing CST-100 Starliner commercial crew vehicle with astronauts on board, a slip that will push back the spacecraft's first operational mission to 2024. Meanwhile, NASA's putting out a request to Sierra Space to submit their capabilities and qualifications to provide a rather redundancy commercial crew vehicle. When the Sierra Nevada Corporation, SNC, lost out on the NASA crew contract in 2014 to Boeing and SpaceX, there were a lot of sympathetic hearts crushed. But SNC didn't give up. They took their crude prototype design and reworked it as the Dream Chaser Cargo, an uncrewed, refurbishable ISS resupply spacecraft. It's a bit smaller than the original crewed concept. It's able to be tucked into a large Vulcan launch vehicle fairing. As a result, the SNC successfully won a bid to resupply the ISS on a commercial resupply services two contract with NASA in 2016 and has been cleared for production. The other two companies' winners are SpaceX and Orbital ATK. This time, no name for Boeing. Boeing found out November 5, 2016 that NASA dropped its bid from consideration. Each of the three companies is guaranteed at least six missions to the ISS starting in 2019 under the new NASA contract. We picked them because it's a great proposal, said Kirk Shireman, NASA's ISS program manager, when asked about the SNC Space Systems bid using Dream Chaser. It's a really capable vehicle, and we're really looking forward to having it in our suite of options. NASA said it was careful in its selection process after the accidents and due to the complexity of proposals. That delayed contract awards by seven months and contributed to pushing back the earliest of planned flights under the new contracts from 2018 to late 2019. SNC Space Systems is a division of SPARKS, Nevada-based Sierra Nevada Corp., a privately held aerospace and defense contractor. It acquired Louisville-based SpaceDev and in doing so picked up the Dream Chaser project that SpaceDev started on in 2005 under Sir Angelo's leadership. NASA has awarded SNC Space Systems $300 million towards Dream Chaser under past programs designed to stoke private sector spacecraft development. SNC invested a significant amount as well. Dream Chaser is a four to seven seat space plane based on a design originally created by NASA. It's designed to fly and land unmanned or to be flown by a pilot. NASA proposed the cargo resupply contracts to be worth as much as 14 billion collectively. Agency officials said they don't expect to spend that much, even if it goes beyond the minimum 18 launches and the three companies would split. NASA also plans to tailor missions and select which company spacecraft it'll use depending on the nature and size of the cargo. That makes it impossible to say how much the contracts would eventually be worth to any of the three companies, Shireman said. SNC Space Systems proposes to use the Dream Chaser space plane launched atop a Vulcan rocket to carry cargo up to and bring trash and scientific samples and pressurized containers back to Earth, most likely at NASA's runways at Cape Canaveral, Florida, which were built for the space shuttle program. The Dream Chaser's runway landing would give NASA and researchers the chance to take possession of returning research samples in as little as three hours. That's a huge advance for science and compared to spacecraft used now, says Julie Robinson, chief scientist for NASA's ISS. The quick return is especially valuable for research on understanding the effects of zero gravity on microbes, cells, or plants. Effects that can diminish quickly after samples return to Earth, she said. Such a rapid return is something science has lacked since the retirement of the space shuttle fleet, which happened shortly after the ISS was commissioned as a research station. Scientists have had to rely on samples returned by capsules parachuting into the ocean or onto land. If they have a really hard landing, they crash down or they've been at sea for a couple of days, that really disrupts things, Robinson said. Dream Chaser is a really nice addition to the ability we have now.
NASA's selection of SNC's space plane returns a fully reusable space plane into the U.S. fleet again, Sarangelo says. What's really satisfying about this is its clear validation for even having this kind of runway vehicle for space, Sarangelo says. We're carrying the torch for the shuttle program and all the thousands who worked on it. Had we not won this contract, there'd be nobody working on this kind of vehicle. Now, Dream Chaser Tenacity is almost ready for the first launch. In late October, NASA tweeted mentioning, Teamwork makes the Dream Chaser work. The first joint training simulation for at NASA and Sierra spaceflight controllers happened earlier this month. The teams practiced operations for the new Dream Chaser spacecraft to fly to the at space station. Sierra Space replied, highlighting, Our team enjoyed working with the NASA flight operation team preparing for the upcoming Dream Chaser CRS-2 cargo mission. This is an important step and a good sign that this first mission is coming along. More importantly, unlike Boeing, Sierra Space isn't building Dream Chasers just for NASA, but expects a bigger customer pool, including foreign governments and commercial opportunity. It's a great opportunity for researchers, scientists, and technologies that maybe represent industry consortiums from around the countries. However, to succeed in Sierra Space's goal for Dream Chaser, the program will require some serious infrastructure. Not just processing facilities, but places to land. Dream Chaser needs a runway to land softly, and luckily, there's plenty of those around the world it can use. Right now, the company's launching from Kennedy Space Center right there at Kennedy at Cape Canaveral, Florida. There's also their primary return landing facility they'll have for Sierra Space facilities right there for recovery, reprocessing, and getting ready for the next mission. They also have agreements in place with Huntsville, Alabama, for example. They have an agreement there with the Chamber of Commerce and some other companies, and they will have a landing facility and operation there, potentially. The company's even in talk with other countries for the same sort of application. They're actively pursuing other strategic partnerships where they can, in fact, return the Dream Chaser for missions outside the U.S. Their full anticipation is to stand up a pretty significant facility there, employ hundreds of people to house the facility and conduct the operation. It would be fully private, fully commercial endeavor, and Sierra Space would be pursuing those. After all, while we're having to wait at least another year to see Dream Chaser launch and then land at the launch and landing facility, hopefully the wait will be worth it. And if things go right for Sierra Space, this company could usher in a new era of commercial space opportunity. And that about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget, share your ideas in the comment section. That's right, your support motivates us to create more quality video. And for that, we thank you so much and hope to see you next time.